Okay, let's see what the nerdy corner of the World Wide Web has to offer. This is definitely never a waste of my time that I feel guilty about for the rest of the day. Huh, Fox announces official Alien Day on 426. Uh, it's like 426 the planet from the movie. I get it. And just six days after 420, another cleverly scheduled national holiday. Planned screenings of Alien and Aliens nationwide, as well as tons of limited edition merchandise. You know, if they only came out with a Jonesy-themed beer cozy, that might finally fill up the hole inside of me. Dark Horse plans to release the first issue of a new Aliens miniseries. Cool, cool. I've always said Dark Horse needs to get back to the miniseries format for their Aliens line. So who's working on it? What? Holy sh... Okay, so maybe that was a little melodramatic, but that's how it felt at the time. As soon as it was announced, Dead Orbit was one of my most eagerly anticipated comic releases. I love James Stoko, and I love Alien, but it's that feeling when subject and creator are so good for one another that it's like a serotonin explosion. I knew right away Stoko would do something special with the property. I mean, have you seen Orkstein? Have you seen Godzilla Half Century War? You could tell Stoko was gonna kill it just from looking at the cover. Just that visual idea of entropy, things falling apart, it falls right in line with that, oh shit, everything keeps getting so much worse than I could have ever possibly imagined, modus operandi of the films. And you know what? He did do something special. All four issues are great. It's a masterclass in science fiction or comic craft. You know this if you've already read it. And if you haven't, lucky for you, the trade paperback just came out. Or if you're watching this in 2019, it's about for a year, why don't you have it yet? The title is Aliens Dead Orbit. Aliens, as in the plural, as in the James Cameron sequel. But Dead Orbit is all alien, as in the singular, as in the original Ridley Scott joint. It's claustrophobic, it's blue collar, it's grim, it's nihilistic. In fact, Dead Orbit is so good at evoking the original movie that you could probably just go ahead and put the Jerry Goldsmith score on while you read. Though there are two aliens in here, but that's besides the point. It's obvious things, sure. You want a mysterious vessel? You got it. You want a chest burst scene? Coming right up. Countdown timer? Count on it. You want shit blowing out airlocks? Dead Orbit has all the airlocks. It's clear Stoko's a fan, but more than that, it's clear that he fetishizes the things that make Alien, Alien. The spacesuits, the corridors, the tech, that grungy, greasy, bulky, anti-Apple pit boy aesthetic that Ridley Scott seems to have forgotten about. Even little details, like the way these chestbursters scurry off after they've been born, evokes perfectly the way the puppet moves in the movie. <laughs> However, on subsequent readings, what I've been most impressed by is the economy with which Stoko gets the reader into an alien frame of mind in just the first eight pages, which I want to take a look at now, so as not to spoil the rest of the book for those who haven't read it yet. Stoko is already doing a lot of the heavy lifting on the first page. The first shot opens on Sphacteria, a Wayland yutani space station that gets its name from the planet it orbits called Pylos. You see, Sphacteria is the name of a small island situated at the entrance to the Bay of Pylos in Greece, and was the site of several big historical battles. <gasps> I'm a nerd! <gasps> so am I! The first caption recalls the ship information details from the first film, letting us know the Sphacteria has a crew of six, which is the same number as the Nostromo, by the way, if you don't count the android Ash, or Jonesy, I guess. Going back to the front cover, Stoko is visually introducing the motif of disintegration, things falling apart, right? So when we open on the first page, our brain recognizes the same motif here, so we know there's something wrong with the space station. The second panel zooms in to give a scale, so when we turn the page, and we see how big the first character is in relation to the observation deck, we get a pretty good idea of how big the space station actually is. There's shots like this in Alien as well to give us scale. A character looking out an observation window. This is done more for scale than orientation, since the point of Alien is to eventually just be running around corridors scared for your life, and disorientation is the goal. But giving us this scale allows us to imagine how impossible it would be to predict where a xenomorph may be lurking. First pages are important, but enough about the first page, let's move on. The next four pages are Awesome. There's no dialogue or captions, and illustrates perfectly how much visuals can be used to tell a story. The first panel is one of my favorites. It does a very good job of expressing what Alien is without using any xenomorphs. The space is cramped. The instruments are bulky. Nothing is designed with comfort or elegance in mind. The bottom half of this panel is all tech, tech, tech. Human ingenuity. Science. 
and the top half of the panel is dominated by the void, the abyss, the darkness. Stoko is a hyper-detailed illustrator. He could have put in some stars, the planet Pylos, or the debris floating outside. Instead, the effect of this panel is a perfect encapsulation of what Alien is, the knowable versus the unknowable. What we understand what is versus the frightening Lovecraftian nightmare that is the universe. Let's get out of here. Moving along. This dude wakes up to something on the monitor and we get this great sequence with the cigarettes here. This guy's been here for a while, possibly procrastinating on a task he doesn't want to do. We've all been there. I'll just have one more cigarette, then I'll do it. Oops, there's no more cigarettes. No more excuses. And oh yeah, he's on a pretty strict deadline too. This page is all tone and atmosphere. Stoko takes more opportunities to fetishize Alien's production design. Airlocks, spacesuits, crates, ladders, all very alien. And some more economical visual storytelling here with all this junk piled up against the door, assumedly to keep something out. Next page, this character takes a stroll outside and looks at another vessel in the distance. From his reaction, or non-reaction, it looks like something he already knows about. The next page reorients us in time with the simple word before, and the same space station but in a different condition. Stoko draws the station horizontally and whole. It's simple, and it lets us know that everything in the first four pages was an in medias res. We were brought into the middle of the story, and now we're going back to the beginning. A ship has appeared out of nowhere, and they are trying to hail it with no response. And what could be more alien to start your story with than three guys arguing about whether equipment is malfunctioning, with one of them smoking a cigarette while he fiddles around under a console? Look, we couldn't fix it out here anyway. We gotta rewrite all these ducks, and uh, in order to do that, we've got to try that. Yes, yes, this is all very reminiscent of Alien, but there's something missing. Maybe on the next page? And yep, yep. I called it, there's the coffee. Can I finish my coffee? Mm. It's the only thing good on this shit. Look closely at the mug, and you'll see that it says, eat the apple, fuck the core, which is a nice homage to Drake and Aliens, but it also reminds us of the broader alien universe, and suggests that this character, Park, may have been a former colonial marine. I think this is a good opportunity for a teachable moment. Um, I'm gonna explain the joke on the coffee mug. Hopefully, uh, you'll learn something about how words are pronounced. Teachable moment. It says, uh, fuck the app. No, don't fuck the apple. Eat the apple. You're gonna eat the apple and fuck the core. And it's got a picture of an apple core. It's not corpse. You might be wondering, why does it have a picture of an apple core? Don't fuck the apple. You see, it's because core, C-O-R-E, C-O-R-P-S. That's how, that's how you actually say exactly the same looks like corpse, but this is not, it's not, it's not a marine corpse. It's not a Green Lantern corpse. It's the Colonial Marine core apple core. It's the Green Lantern core. Don't fuck the apple. Thus endeth the lesson. Okay, back to the book. We got more investigation here of the mystery ship from the crew, and much like Parker and Alien, the lower end of the totem character Rook offers the advice that if followed would have kept everyone alive. This is a commercial ship, not a rescue ship. Right. <laughs> it's not my contract to do this kind of duty. Captain says, too bad, we have to check it out, chooses a team, and they embark to see what is up with the ship. Okay, let's rewind a bit, because these pages have the kind of stuff that is easily overlooked and underappreciated, as it is an alien. Alien doesn't get enough credit for how naturally it introduces its characters. Nothing feels forced. They all feel like real people, and you understand their dynamics with each other pretty quickly with very little information. Same goes for Dead Orbit. It's one of my pet peeves in comics, but it's really understandably hard to avoid. Lazy character introductions. The worst offenders are just slapping captions on people with their name, age, occupation, astrological sign, etc., etc. Or the main character narrates and introduces them all to you. That's Captain Hassan. He can be a real ball breaker, but he's a good leader. Or whatever. What's more common is having all the characters address each other with their names every time they talk to each other. Like this. Kyle, is this video way too long already? Uh, I don't know, Ryan, but uh, this whole video is going to be about character names and our audience might get disappointed, or my name isn't Kyle. Well, I guess it's just going to be one of those Ryan and Kyle videos then. Anyway, you get the idea. But look what Stoko does. On the first page, he let us know there were six crew members. By page six, we've seen three of them. Captain Hassan is introduced first because he's on the horn trying to hail the mystery ship. Perfectly natural. The main character, Waskaluski, is introduced when the captain addresses him about the equipment. Since Hassan is deferring to Waskaluski's expertise, we can assume he's the engineer. 
And Waskaluski's jab about not being rated to fix comm officers means this dude is a comm officer and we don't get his name until the following page. Letting us know this character's role before his name keeps the introduction from getting redundant. Five panels, and now we know half the crew and their roles. We know Waskaluski is confident in his job and likes to take the piss out of the comms officer, whose name is Rook, assumedly because he's the youngest crew member on board. Park comes in with coffee, but the reason I know her name is because Stoko made her name tag nice and visible. Again, avoiding redundant artificial introductions. Rook makes an assumption about the ship based on inexperience, and Park comes in to contradict this assumption based on experience, giving us contrast between crewmates based on how long they've been doing this sort of thing. Captain Hassan asks Park about Torrenson, so now we have a fifth crew member's name, but we haven't met him yet. Remember when I compared Rook's advice to Parker's from Alien? Notice the reaction here in these panels. Waskaluski and Parks are silent, and Hassan sighs. This shows that while Rook is maybe a lazy newcomer, there's truth in his words, and they're all reluctant to go investigate a ghost ship. On the next page, Hassan brings up Torrance's name again, this time asking if he has any weapons. Waskaluski says Torrance has a firearm, but no ammo, since at some point he got drunk, did something bad with it, and the ammo has since been jettisoned as a result. This tells us a lot about Torrenson, and the idea of a crew member drunkenly firing off a weapon falls right in line with the alien, blue-collar, space trucker vibe. Hassan wants to bring the harmless weapon for show, just in case, which again, shows smart thinking from the captain. He mentions to Park to also get Doc Harrow before heading out, and finally on this page, we're introduced to crew members five and six. From left to right, we can assume this guy is Doc Harrow from the medical symbol on his suit, and that this is Torrenson because he has the firearm. And off they go. This stuff might seem really boring, but to me, it's as indicative of how well Stoko evokes the original Alien movie as he does the more flashy aspects. A big reason Alien is so successful is because of how memorable the crew is, and a big part of how memorable the crew is is how much depth of character we get in a natural, economic way. That's not our system. I know that. For example, it's not like we know that much about Kane in the movie, but he's the first out of the pods in the beginning, and he's the only volunteer for the derelict mission. So it follows that curiosity eventually kills the cat in this case. Of course, there's so much more than that, but I don't want to spoil it. From chest bursting scenes to tense scenes of dread and survival horror against the backdrop of a ticking clock, Stoko hits all the major notes perfectly. Especially the ending, which made me recall someone who likened the Xenomorph to death itself. An unstoppable force that you might be able to run from or hide from, but you can never, ever actually escape. This isn't all to say, however, that Dead Orbit is just some rip-off of Alien. It establishes its own identity with some pretty horrific shit and original concepts mined from the Alien mythology without copying what came before. It also distinguishes itself by doing some really creative stuff with non-linear storytelling that's pretty much only possible to do with a comic book. Dead Orbit is so dense with good stuff, I can make my way through every single page and talk about it. I didn't even get a chance to talk about this one, which I actually own. And I hazard a guess that some of you guys would actually probably like that, and it kind of gave me a weird idea. Would you guys be interested in like a comic book commentary? I guess sort of like uh, like riff tracks, but for a comic book. You'd basically have to have the comic book out in front of you, or you'd have to have it open on your computer or something like that, and then you could just listen to my stupid voice talk about the entire comic book page by page. I don't know, it's just kind of a weird idea. It wouldn't be too difficult to do, I don't think, and you guys might get something out of it. Let us know in the comments. It's a kind of a weird idea, but it could work. You might say it's a Kyle and Ryan idea. As a final note, I just want to say, if you pick up the trade paperback, there are some really cool extras in the back, including Stoko's original pitch to Dark Horse. Originally, the plan was to do more of a James Cameron-style, action-heavy book, and he drew some pages of what that might look like. It makes sense since Stoko's style lends itself so well to big, energetic action, and I'm very impressed that he challenged himself to do more of a moody, tonal, scary, tense book, and did it so successfully. All that being said, holy shit, look how fucking cool that looks! When can we get him back for a James Cameron-style book with Space Marines? Like, soon, yes? This book's really cool. Um, I think it might be the new best Alien comic. I had to start thinking about the other top three video that we did, and uh, yeah, this might be number one, which is cool that they're still raising the bar after this many years. Uh, uh, no, not number one. What do you think is number one? I mean, come on, nothing. You don't Labyrinth. think it's as good as Labyrinth? Labyrinth is insane. 
Labyrinth is freaking good, fucking good. If you haven't read Labyrinth, make sure you go read Aliens Labyrinth. Um, but this one's pretty damn good. And check out Stoko's other stuff. Um, I This is not his first big like licensed classic. He did a book called Godzilla Half Century War, which I was joking about earlier. That book is insane. Uh, if you're into like giant monsters and a Godzilla at all or anything like that, just buy it. It's uh, it, it, it will not be a waste of your time. So anyway, that's it. Go check out Dead Orbit. It's out in trade paperbacks. It should be in stores, Barnes Noble and every other place, Amazon, so, so on and so on. And uh, thank you to our patrons and subscribers. Um, if you're not a subscriber, not a patron, maybe think about clicking that button. You can just start with the subscriber one and then maybe move them onto the patron button a little bit later or you, whatever, you know, we were fucking apples earlier. So just jump, jump straight into the patron button and do the subscribe button later or not at all. Money's better. So uh, that's it. I can't think of anything else to say. Kyle's laughing behind the camera. So I think it did a good job. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> right, right? Yeah, that's it.